actually before then, I should say that Trey has his uh, Master of Fine Arts degree from San Jose State University in California, and um, before that, an uh, undergraduate degree in ceramics from Bowling Green, um, and is currently um, a professor of ceramic art at the University of Montana in Missoula. He's also traveled extensively in China, and we're gonna learn more about that in the slides tonight. So join me in welcoming Trey. Is that on? Can you hear me? Thanks, Lisa. Thanks for bringing me out. Uh, thanks everyone for having me. Um, I changed, I have a couple different talks that I like to do, and I changed this one and altered it a bit. Uh, for you all, because I had a feeling that the audience would be primarily students. And I, so in doing that, I went way back to work that is gonna be kind of awkward and a little bit odd, but I think it's helpful for students to see. So I think it's different if somebody gets up here and they show you all this polished work and hey, I've gotten to do all these great things. Um, I think it's helpful to see early work. So you can kind of see where I came from. So this is gonna be a little bit more um, kind of of a storyline and what I want to focus on, my goal here, is I want to talk about saying yes to things. And I want you as artists to think about ways that you can say yes. And if you get opportunities, uh, just ways to enable yourself to take these. And I think it's really, uh, it can be really formative for your career. But I think it's easy to say no to things. So it's kind of my, if there's a theme to this, it's that. So I went to school, as Lisa said, I went to school in Bowling Green, Ohio. And Bowling Green is in northern Ohio. It's completely flat, surrounded by cornfields. I mean, flat. So we went to the studio. And I was young. I was proud. I mean, I was the traditional college student. I was 18 years old. I bounced around a little bit in school. I was telling the folks earlier this morning that I like to do things outside, you know, when I was a kid. And everybody said, well, you should go and study environmental science. That's like what people do who like it outside. Well, that was terrible for me. And I found my way in the sculpture department and I took a class in there and I thought, I can't believe you can do this. Nobody tell me to do this. So I think that, um, and then I found my way over into ceramics. And the ceramics department, this is just some really early pieces. The ceramics department was really active. And the studio was, I mean, it was just where you went. We were 18, 19, 20, 21. People would go out, but really you went to the studio. And that was, if you weren't there for a day, somebody would say, where have you been? So we created a place to work. And the, our professor who was there, his name's John Balistrieri, he was working in the studio and he was an animal and nobody could keep up. So we just worked, he worked, and it was this environment and this way of working, this kind of fever that grabbed me as much as the material did. Um, this is a real early piece. And I was, made, I was building these pieces that were very formal. So what I mean by formal is, I was dealing with ideas of just formal sculpture. I was looking at line, I was dealing with balance, I was dealing with tension. And I started building these pieces that all the components needed to work together in order for the piece to stand up. So you can see there's four separate pieces and then a steel band wrapped around the middle, which keeps them all working. So I was also working over in sculpture, I was carving stone, I was welding, I was mixing different materials. Another piece uh, to your left is a clay piece. And this piece, and so all the clay pieces that you've seen so far are fired in an atmospheric kiln. I'm not sure if you all have those here, but what that means is you put salt into the kiln, you put wood into the kiln, but a lot of the surfaces I was getting were really muted. Lots of brown, so I had this portfolio put together of kind of the quintessential brown. And about that time, I was trying to, here's a couple, I'll just keep going. So, see more browns. And just a little bit of stone and some steel. Again, these are pieces that are, interacting with each other to stay, stay up. And I was very naive, to say the least. And I would think, okay, I can do anything I want. As long as this thing will stand up, I can get into the gallery. Well, the gallery director said, there's no way in hell I'm putting that in there. I said, no, it's fine. You know, there's a couple, 200 pound stone up top and then this steel wire that they told me could hold all this weight. She says, yeah, until this kid comes up and grabs on it and you made this booby trap fall on it. So it started to make me think just about, okay, right, I do have a different sense of responsibility to the pieces and how do they stand and how do other people exist with them. Holy smokes. Pretend you didn't just see all that. 
Okay, I'm not sure why that happened. So on the advice of um, my professor, I looked at lots of different schools for graduate school. So I went directly into graduate school from undergraduate school. And this is one of my professor's work, Stan Welsh. And this is current work of his. Um, and so this was out in California. Now I grew up in Cincinnati. I was working in Northern Ohio. California was, when I landed there, was really like another world, like another planet. The work was different. Their use of color was different. The museums were absolutely amazing. We could go up to San Francisco for First Friday. Well, coming from Ohio, that's a real big pleasure. The work we saw was the work, work we'd see in the MoMA was the work we would see in books back in Ohio. So it really gave me a different sense of making. Um, so I get to graduate school, and I really thought I knew what I was doing. I think that something like this happens when you graduate sometimes. You think, okay, I got this. I got my diploma. I got my got my stuff all together here, I'm going to come make some art. So I was moved out to San Jose, and San Jose was extremely expensive then, and still is, and I couldn't afford to find a place to live, so I was staying in the studio, which is not ideal. So I was living in that little studio that I was working in. So what that meant is all I did was make stuff, and that's really all it was was stuff. And one of my professors came in, it was my first critique, and he was one of the sculpture faculty. He says, oh, look at all this stuff. Jeez, oh, Pete, you've been busy. You've only been here for two weeks. And I have a full studio of stuff. Stuff. He says, he starts talking. He goes, this looks like, man, this looks like something I've seen before. Like, no, he said, this looks like something that could be in a magazine. Or this looks, man, this really looks like some artwork here. I'm like, well, that's all sounding a little bit. I'm not quite sure where this is going. He goes, but what the hell is it? And who, and what are you thinking and what's going on? And I was like, well, I'm making these things. And I started kind of blabbing and just vomiting at the mouth for a minute. And he goes, mm, yeah, we gotta work on this. He says, do you, does this work about anything? Do you care about anything? He goes, do you have any feelings about anything? And I'm like, oh my God, this is going awful. Now I'm like, honestly, like kind of quivering a little bit so he can't see it. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh, now I'm like feeling terrible. He goes, what do you feel now? I said, I feel terrible. He goes, at least that's something. So he goes, remember this feeling for a minute. Why don't you think on this for a bit? I'm like, okay. So I did, and I just threw everything out the window that I had done. And I started to make these pieces that were kind of these very simple, minimal, abstracted figures that were clinging to the wall, because that's how I felt. So they started to convey just a little bit of information. And here's another one um, with the cinder block tied to it, kind of cascading downwards. And this is a piece, I was talking earlier about Bondo, and this piece has Bondo in it. I want to talk a little bit about making here and about kind of going, working through ideas. As I was building this piece, um, I fired it. I was really unhappy with the surface. It was kind of this um, Easter egg looking color that I didn't really like. And then I was sitting in the studio and then I broke it. And I felt like, you know, I had this little, somebody offered me an opportunity to have one piece in a show and it wasn't that big of a deal, but to me it was a huge deal at that time. I needed to make this work piece was this kind of terrible color. So then I figured, okay, I got to do something to it. So I covered the piece with Bondo. And then the piece was kind of this pink, and I wasn't actually convinced on that. And then I sanded back through the Bondo a little bit. And then I kind of hit the Bondo with a little bit of a torch, and I started to kind of build up some surface, and I started to get some layers to it. Now, do I think this is a great piece? No. This is an early piece, but it taught me how to kind of work through ideas and to not give up. Sometimes we get ceramic pieces out of killing you all. I was talking to somebody earlier about this. He said, yeah, glazing so hard, I get some out of the kiln. If it's bad, then what? It's, I'm stuck. Think about how you can continue to work on these pieces. So about this time, I was in graduate school, and I got a job working at a steel fabrication shop. And what we did is we would build other people's pieces for them. So this, I don't even know who made this or where this was, and this was just one of many pieces that we would build in this shop. So you could get a commission for something, bring it to our shop, and we would build it for you. Now, granted, I say we, it was me and two other, uh, two other fellows who were young. The guy who was running the shop quit, so then I was in charge. It was a mess of a shop. We had a great time. We made a ton of work for people. And I learned about a kind of a, a really efficient way of working. And I learned about a way of production. And I also learned about how to manage my time. Because after we were working on these pieces, or after I'd go to work, I'd go back home and go to my studio. And by then, so those were two images from graduate school of countless, and they were kind of bad ones to kind of state some examples. 
About this time, I was getting out of graduate school, and I had a little studio at my house. It was very simple. At first, it was just my backyard, and I just worked out in the backyard on a table. And what I want to be clear about here is that things do not have to be fancy. I think you get down and you work in these studios and everything is kind of supplied for you and everything feels really good. Really, to make your work, all you have to do, all you need is a space. You could practically make it on the floor. With clay, you need a table, you need a little bit of material, and you need a way to get it hot. And that's not that complicated anymore. If you draw, it's even easier. If you paint, you don't need to get it hot. Can you see what I mean here? There's ways to always make this work and keep working. So I started building this work, and this piece, I think, I was one of the first pieces perhaps I made in that studio, and the work started to become a little bit more situational. And at that job, I was, you know, we all find ourselves in kind of these tight situations, and we built fence after fence at that steel fabrication shop, and we had this steel ball welded onto a steel rod, and you'd run it down the fence to make sure that ball couldn't fit through the hole. The ball was a baby's head. It's code. Baby's head can't get stuck in the fence. It almost makes me start thinking about baby's head stuck in the fence. Then I think about my own head stuck in a fence and how I seem to get there every once in a while. Everybody has these situations where you're kind of in that spot and you feel like you're sitting in the fence and you know, how do I get here? So I built a lot of work in this time that was kind of situational, putting myself into these situations. About this time, these pieces were from the studio at my house. And you can see some welded steel components with it, a sawhorse, and starting to use some different objects, and all these objects are start, hopefully starting to add to the dialogue of this piece. So what I mean by dialogue and is, what, is this, what are these pieces conveying to the viewer? And you're probably sitting out there going, I have no idea. The way I like to work is I like to choose different images and ha or different objects and have these objects symbolize different things so they all can work together, and I'm hoping the pieces kind of can come across slowly as poetry, not that you look at them immediately and understand so it's a steel cake tray on the top, held up by a leg, and a uh, speed bag on your left. So these pieces were all built. Are those washed out, or do they look pretty good? They look a little washed out from here. I guess there's nothing I can do about that. Um, so then I started to change the work a little bit, and I started, I was still working with the figure, but even kind of smaller parts. So I built, these, I built several of these tongue shapes. Then onto these tongues, I would add these kind of phallic elements. And then on the tips of those, I put, um, I knitted small little hats, little wool hats that went onto the top. And then I was started, this started an absolute craze for me and my work of using fishnet stockings on things. I fell in love with it. I went nuts. So you saw, like, let me go back one real quick. So these are two of these leg forms, and I made so many. Somebody came over who lived in my neighborhood, and she go, oh, my God, this would look so good with fishnet stockings on. I have some. Let's see. So we slid these fishnet stockings over it, and I was like, I'm in. So I started using these, and what I like about it is I like the way what you know what fishnet stockings are and what they do when you put them on something, how they expand, how they contract. They would work with the form, and the surfaces would change with the form. So this piece is called Just a Little Taste. And about this time, I didn't turn into a pirate, but I got invited to go work in Latvia. And this is kind of where I want to start talking about saying yes to things. Because I was young, I was just out of graduate school, and one of my peers from school had this uh, program where he would bring artists out from all over the world, and they would make work. And if you could get there, everything was supplied for you. But if you don't have any money and you're a little bit, I was very young. So things seemed hard, and I almost didn't go because I didn't have enough money. And you know, I'm not trying to say save all your pennies and spend it on your work, but I also kind of am. I'm a big believer in spending money on your work, spending money on your materials, on whatever it takes to do your work. So I went out to Latvia, and we worked in this little fishing village, and it was a, we were working somewhere. Right over here, like maybe in that open field right there. So we just worked outside in this field, and there's all these artists out there working. The food was different. The place was different. The culture was different. The beer was different. Every single thing was different. I couldn't really talk to anybody. And I thought, man, this is fun. Totally different. I'm working in a field. We're welding in a field. We're just, it was just a different way of working. It got me out of my comfort zone. So as a fishing village, they really wanted us to work and kind of be a part of the community. Fishermen would come over. It was just a, a fantastic time. So anyways, I, 
but it's also very fast. It's a symposium. We were there for two weeks. You have to build a finished piece. Very hard for me to get something done in two weeks you put outside. So I went around, I looked, and, and I started to see things. So I started to notice all these boat cleats that the fishermen would tie their boats up to. So I built this boat cleat for them, made some clay tiles, covered that with concrete, polished it, and then they put it out on the dock there. It's really funny because they, see the little boat cleats next to it? And then sometimes boaters would come up and tie their boat to it. And it was awesome. And it, is it the best piece? No, but I had a great time making it. It felt like it made sense there. And then when I went back, they said, hey, we moved your piece and we put it on a stump in front of the fishing museum. I said, well, how about that? So it might even look better there. But anyways, you know, you kind of do things, you drop something off, and then pieces get a little bit out of your control. About this time, I came back. I was still working in that little studio in my house. And it was very, very simple. And I applied to this place called the Archie Bray Foundation. I got a call from Josh Luis. He said, hey, we'd love for you to come out and work for two years. Come on out. And I almost didn't go because I didn't have any money. And I talked to one of my professors, and they said, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. What do you mean you don't have any money? Make some and go. And I just wasn't ready to kind of let go and just to jump in like I should. And so upon, you know, consultation with people, I moved out here. And I moved from uh, California to Helena, Montana. And I said it felt like a shock to go to California from Ohio. Well, moving to Montana from California felt a bit like a shock. One of the first things I noticed was all the animals on people's cars. Didn't see that. And I love that. I'm into it. I'm in. The other thing I noticed that I wasn't that into was all the testicles hanging off the back of the pickup trucks. And I thought, what in the world? Who the hell does that out here? And a lot of people did that. And it just seems like it's gone a little bit out of fashion, but it, you still see them. So I was doing work at the time, and I was using imagery from uh, like motorcycles. This is a motorcycle tank, a ceramic motorcycle tank with fishnet stockings, a leather skirt, and three testicles. I was interested in that kind of that bit of one-upmanship of like, I'm hanging my testicles off the truck. It seemed so absolutely ridiculous to me that I figured I could take it somewhere myself. I want to talk a little bit about the imagery here and a little bit about the, um, the stockings and the use of stockings um, and the skirt. This piece might be a good one to talk a bit about. Um, the stockings really came to symbolize the idea of attraction to me. And I started to research more and more about um, ideas of attraction and seduction. The idea of a motorcycle is very simple for me. Um, I bought one and never got to use it. So it was kind of this thing that I had. I'm like, oh yeah, I have this cool motorcycle and I'm going to take it to California. That just didn't work. It's a long story. So that is kind of this thing of this bit of my life that didn't quite work. But that was always kind of this dreamy thing. Um, and then the leather mixed with the skirt is kind of a bit of an idea of dealing with gender a little bit. And my work deals with um, what well, something that I meant. I'm trying to see what I'm something that I mentioned earlier in the class is that I'm very aware of where I live and what I look like. I live in Montana. I have a beard. Uh, heck, I'm wearing a plaid shirt right now. Um, I make an effort to try and not not necessarily. Um, I guess what I want to say is that I'm aware uh, that I fit into a certain thing that I necessarily don't feel like I always fit into, which makes me buy purple pants and pink shirts and put my earrings back in so I remember there's a balance here that doesn't have to be so heavy on one side. Um, so a lot of the times with my work, I'll use masculine imagery and then use feminine objects or imagery to put with it. This is my studio at the Archie Bray Foundation, which, let me see how I'm doing on time. So this will, I told Lisa, hour and a half, okay. 45 minutes, 50 minutes. <laughs> I know how, how it is to sit there. Um, I do want to say just a couple things about residencies and, and opportunities in general. Um, if they come your way, take them. And if you get to work somewhere with other people like this, like I was working by myself in my own little house, in my own studio. Nobody comes over and talks to me. Nobody asks me what I'm making or why I'm making it or what in the world I'm doing or why I'm doing it. Nobody really cares. And then you go somewhere like this into a really actively creative environment, working with other artists who are thinking about the same things and pushing the same things and trying things they don't know if they're going to work and pushing the material, pushing ideas. And really, there's failure, there's success, there's camaraderie. Um, I can't say enough about putting yourself in those situations. So the reason I included this is 
I think it's, I know a lot of you just came from your Ceramics 1 class and a lot of you are probably taking a clay class here or have worked with clay. If you see the pieces, so there's one piece on your left that's a motorcycle tank with horns on the top of it. The motorcycle tank is sitting in a bucket of sand. This piece that's in the middle that's a tongue shape with a leg and a wishbone coming off and another tongue, excuse me, on the top is also in a bucket of sand. But then I would build these structures around them with ropes so I could put my pieces on there. Like this wishbone on your right is a mold of my arms. That's a wishbone that I can set on that piece. And then when I put that string up there, it lets, it's like I'm holding my piece up, but I'm not there. Does that make sense? So I just want you to think if you're putting your clay on, you go, this doesn't work. I can't get this to stay. Just think about lift. Think about how to get your pieces there. And you can see these bighorn sheep. Uh, these, a lot of this imagery comes back. So I feel like my work has a sense of that it kind of rolls and it, I dig back into, I kind of have a toolbox of imagery. Uh, this piece is called rumble strip, which is when you're on the highway and you're just starting to not pay attention and you hit the rumble strip. It's a leg and a, um, a gas tank. It's kind of a larger piece, maybe just over seven feet. So again, I was looking at these ideas of attraction and seduction, and I was also starting to think about what's the opposite of that, and then I thought, well, what is repulsion and what does that mean? And can repulsion and attraction all kind of be there at the same time? So I started looking at contortionists and how contortionists have this kind of beauty to them, but it's also not that attractive. And this piece was a really eye-opener for me because as you're sitting there looking at this, this looks like a leg that has kind of been cut in half and another leg that's not cut in half. And that wasn't my intention. And so that's another reason I show this because sometimes the things that are very obvious to the viewer aren't so obvious when you're making them. So for me, I had pictures of contortionists up in my studio and somebody can bend their whole back over like this and flip over and their legs flip down. Their head would be where the pedestal is, but by truncating it and changing it so much, I turn into kind of a truncated leg. It's another one of the abstracted contortionist series. Then I started doing work with the wishbone really started to come into play. So these are full size legs. This piece is called Lucky You. It's another piece. This is uh, the image of your knee when you're in the bathtub and just your knees up above the water with ram horns wrapped around it and some flowers. Now, with my work, I like to, as these pieces are going to start to get a little bit more complex, they'll get a few more objects interacting with them. If you were in the lecture this morning, what I was talking about is how objects can work together and communicate together and how objects can convey thoughts and ideas. So if you think about a wishbone, you think, okay, I kind of have some understanding about a wishbone. And the piece that's in the front here that's gold is a boat cleat. So I can kind of think I know what a boat cleat does. It kind of secures something. A wishbone is a bit of hope, wishing for something. Somebody wins, somebody loses. And then I've got kind of a um, puffed up, abstracted leg. So all these things working together. And in my mind, I've got a pretty clear idea of why I'm choosing these things. And as the viewer looks at them, they don't have that clear idea. And they look at them, and they don't really get it. And I don't want to make work to specifically confuse people, but I also don't like to make work and explain every single detail about why I do it because I think it takes away some of the mystery of the work. I was saying this morning, it's kind of like getting the, the New York Times crossword puzzle and getting it all figured out. It's not really as fun if you have all the answers to it. So there's kind of a funny story about this piece, and I'll tell it real quick. Got this piece into a show, super excited about the show. Entered a couple shows at the same time. Got this piece into two shows. Then I was like, well, heck, now what am I supposed to do? Probably tell one show I can't do it, but I didn't do that. So I built this piece over again. So there's two of them, and I tried to build it exactly the same, and I didn't have it, so I built it from the little card that I had, which is really hard to do. So and then in order to make sure I got it, I built three of them. So I ended up with three pieces. And it's really, uh, I, I believe, an unethical thing to do because this piece should be one of it, not two of it. But I just mentioned it because I think it's, you know, you get yourself into a situation like that, there's usually a correct decision and not the right one. So I would encourage you to go the right way. So here's another piece, and you can see the, um, some different elements coming together here. There's a leg, there's a broken wishbone, the other part of the wishbone. This is out at a place called the LH Project out in Oregon. And after the Archie Bray, this is just so you can see. So I build these pieces upside down, flip them over, 
they exist like this. I can't build them this way because they wouldn't hold their own weight. So again, I got invited to go out to the LH project. It was beautiful. It was an amazing place to work. I get to work with fantastic people. While I was out there, this is me looking a little bit rugged with my friends trying to help me install this piece. We're trying to figure this out. So I got invited to go out to China. And I also had an opportunity to build a pretty big piece for this couple for their yard. So I built this piece for them. And then I was able to use that money to go to China. Another, this is a really good image to look at. So if you're going to build a piece and then leave it somewhere and never see it again, roll up the hose behind the piece <laughs> because you're going to show this slide in a talk sometime, and that looks a little ridiculous. Um, but can you see what I mean? I was able to work one residency into um, going to somewhere else. I was able to make work at a residency to help me finance another one. And I don't really want to say, hey, you've got to sell your work to do things because you don't. You don't have to sell your work at all. I don't think sales of your work, you should even be thinking about it or care about it. That's something that you can deal with later. While you're a student, I would just say, make your work and make your best work. I met this guy. His name's Dr. Ichi Shu. And he came into my studio and he said, hey, this looks really fun work. What, do you want to come to China? And again, I almost said no. I don't know why my first instinct is to say, oh, I can't do that. Oh, yeah. So then I figured, OK, I'll do, make this piece and go to China. And so I made all this work in China. I included this so you could kind of see how these pieces get fired upside down. Now. I've been to China, um, I've been really lucky. Once you kind of get to go somewhere, you meet people. You meet people at a gallery, you meet somebody at a museum. You meet somebody else who runs a different residency. You know what else I think is really important, and I, I believe this, is that when you go out there and you're working somewhere else, be a nice person. These people are taking you in. You're working with them. They are giving to you. Be nice to them. Be nice to the people you meet in other countries. You know what I mean? You go somewhere, just be a good person. And then people meet you like, hey, this guy's a pretty nice guy. We could have him come work with us. Can you see what I'm getting at? If you go somewhere and you're kind of pompous or you say, I need this. Hey, how come this doesn't work right? Nothing works right everywhere. Anywhere you go, things don't work, right? So just take that into consideration. And by being a good person, I'm not trying to lecture you on being a good person. But go out there and be a good person, and then you get invited back. And other people meet you. So this little China section here is a combination of several trips to China working with some Chilean folks, um, made, met really fantastic people working in all different kinds of disciplines. This is a hardware store. How awesome is that? Wow. Material, it's on the ceiling. It's awesome. Everything felt, it was like going to Latvia. Things were just different than they were what I was used to. So this is another piece from China, and this is larger scale work, obviously. And so I went over here for this trip, and I built... Let me see what's, well, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. So this is just, just take this as just another China image. But look, like put a stool out, put another stool on top of it. You know, it's just practical, just be practical. So I was working out, I'm not sure why that image is kind of cut off like that, we'll zip through that. But this is, that's the piece in the foreground and this is it fired. And again, so that's the seat from a unicycle, a conductor from a power line a leg and a wishbone and a tongue. This piece is called Blue China. Clay was different. At first it was really hard and then I was like, oh, I fell in love with it. You know, you get used to different things and you go somewhere and you go, well, this isn't like the clay I get in my box from Georgie's. Well, obviously not. But then you realize, hey, these people, and then I looked around and I said, well, wake up. Look what these people are doing with this. They're making this work. Um, some other ways of building. So I was doing, I stacked up these stools and just using, I just want you to see, can you see how I built that form to build the piece on? And then I would ratchet strap it to the form. And then I would flip that whole form over and stack it up like so. So after that trip to China, I came back and I was working at the University of South Carolina. And when I was in China, I met a great woman named Virginia Scotchy. She said, would you come teach for me while I'm on sabbatical? Hey, Trey, you seem like a nice guy. Do you see what I'm getting at? And then you say, okay, sure, I can go do this. So I went over there and worked for her for a while. Olivia, my fantastic partner, we packed up our little crappy truck, drove it across the country, got to South Carolina, it was super hot, wasn't really used to it, everything was different, Olivia hated it, worked there for one semester, and then a job came up at the University of Montana. And I applied for that, I applied for a couple jobs. And I was lucky enough to get two interviews, and I was really felt, feel really great about getting this job. So I moved to the University of Montana, and this was my colleague, Beth Lowe, who is a saint of a woman, and if you ever see an exhibition or Beth Lowe's name on an exhibition anywhere. She has family here in Portland. 
so she'll have shows here. If you ever see Beth's name on an exhibition or a lecture, you gotta go. She makes great work, it's just, and she is a fantastic person. I can't say enough good things. My other colleague, Julia Galloway, who I have to gush about a little bit too, I think makes some of the best pots. She is a fantastic potter and an exceptional teacher. She's one of the most giving people I know. I sit in that studio, sometimes I close my door trying to get a little bit of my work and I can just hear the students funneling into Julia's studio and office. Just, she's a really giving person. So that being said, I live in Missoula, I teach at the university. If you're in town, you're always welcome to stop in the studio and visit with us. We're there almost every day. So I built this studio. Didn't think we could do it. Had a house. My friend who's sitting back here, John, nobody likes to be called out during a talk, so sorry, John. There's an old barn there. And somebody came over and said, that would be a good idea. You could just lift that barn up and turn it into a studio. John and I dug a trench around the barn, dug under the barn, got carjacks, lifted the building up in the air. We don't have any idea what we're doing. Lifted the building up in the air, just like, hey, okay, it's a building. Let's put it up. We're going to put a foundation under it. John's inside the building or outside, one of us vice versa. We take something off the whole back wall of the building, falls down. We stop, we go inside, take a break. A couple days later, we knock the building down, and I built this studio. So I would say, think about that. If somebody says that's a good idea, ask somebody else. Because if you don't know what you're doing, I, a lot of things I do, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, I don't know how to do this. So I hired a contractor. He would say, do all these things, I'll be back in a week. So those are my students. So this is us building the studio. That's the kiln pad out in the back. This is the view from the studio window. Now, that's the studio. So it seems like when I look at it now, I think, God, that was a lot of work. And you know what? It was a lot of work, but I had people help me, and it, believe, it wasn't that expensive either. You know, we did it for so cheap. We would go, we would, everything's used. I got that from the local sawmill. This is just scrap steel. So everything was relatively inexpensive, and I loved the studio. Um, here's me. This is the back. This, so I built a kiln in the back here. There's Olivia standing inside the kiln. We were talking about sweatpants. She hates this picture because I show it and she has sweatpants on. Um, so there's the kiln, and that's the frame of this kiln. And here's the structure. So every time I go to China, I was building these big pieces. And I think, oh, my God, I go back to China and build some more big work. Or I want to go to the Archie Bray and build some more big work. I'm like, this is ridiculous. I want to build as big a kiln as I want. So that kiln, you can put a nine-foot-tall piece in it. It's big. It has a car. It rolls out. That being said, I was building it at my house. Ran out of money. Couldn't quite get it finished. Gas line ended up being way more expensive, like incredibly more expensive. So I moved this kiln to school, and we just finished it. So now the students can use it. I don't have to pay for the gas. This is an image from the studio. And what I want you to see is look at all that stuff. And all of a sudden, I look at that, and I'm like, what the hell is all that stuff? And look at that. There's a big lion. There's an upside-down horse. It's just like that was a winter break, you know? And I was like, I'm going to try some things. That stuff didn't leave the studio. And there's a lot of weight and clay in there. What I mean didn't leave the studio is I just tried it, and I wasn't thrilled. So it just stayed. There's nothing in there that left. But then I started to think, okay, so I'm sitting there, and I'm working. So this is a little hobby. You know what a hobby horse is, what kids bounce on? And I'm still very new to Montana, and I'm trying to embrace this Western culture in the fakest way I can by making a hobby horse. Because my colleagues, one is a rancher, the other is this, and I'm like, oh my God, I have no idea, I don't even know how to walk up to a horse. So my uh, entrance to Montana was through the hobby horse. This piece is called, oh geez, I can't remember for a second. This piece is called uh, one in front of the other. So again, I started working with these tripod working with these pieces up, and you can see this kind of internal organ, you can see the horn, and then the leg from a table. I gotta get this show on the road here. Uh, now you can see a decoy image in there, this kind of, these internal organs and a really, what's called like a soft canteen. And then here you see this piece that's covered with lead on the outside. This piece is called um, slowly from left to right. And that's part, it's not, I made it, but it's a, it's a part of a sexton, which is a navigational tool which I love because I started to think about this idea of the unseen and the things that we can't see that are quite right in front of us. So that idea of the sexton leading us into where we can't go. Um, this piece is called Rack and Pinion. Again, me trying to warm up to being a Montana, and this is the back. Oh, so this is even so classic. So I moved to Montana, and I see all these deer on people's cars. I'm like, I got it. I'm going to investigate this a little bit. 
So then I think that the kind of the backside of the white-tailed deer is this precious part of the deer. So I figured to make the most, well, it's really not. It's like the, the tenderloin or the back strap, it's not this. So then I started to try and use a little bit of white tail imagery. I was using, again, a stool and a seat from a unicycle. I'm sorry, that's advancing slowly. I'm not sure what that is. Okay, so I was making wall pieces at the same time. Again, combining imagery, you can see the sexton in there. You can also see how the underglaze is starting to move a little bit on this. And I was really trying to research how to, um, how to let the clay move a little, or how to let the surface move a bit. My surfaces were feeling really tight. This piece is called Red Pony. It's a wall piece. This piece is called The Divide. You can see that decoy head that's coming in there, and I started to use that decoy because as another way to talk about attraction, because if you think about what a decoy does, it's just that. Now, every year on January 1st, if I'm at home, I try and build a piece start to finish, and they usually don't work. They do, but they usually I don't include them, but I felt like this one kind of had something going for it. Remember that image in my studio when I said, that's the window looking out? Well, there's a mountain right in front of my house. So the day before, the day, the day before I took my, as the sun tracked its way across the window, I put a little dot every hour where the sun was. So that created a line. So that's the line of the sun, and that's the space between the mountains and the sun that day, very loosely with the mountains, obviously. So I start to look at, again, I wanted to kind of approach the figure in a different way, and I was looking at these ideas of attraction and beauty, and I wanted to see how it had been done in sculpture. So I covered my studio with all these images of historic Greek and Roman stone pieces. And what I started to notice is they were all leaning on something. See how this is leaning? It's the David. See the little thing that's kind of simple that you don't really notice, which is that tree trunk sitting down there? So these pieces structurally can't exist without, they break off at the ankles. You see so many of these pieces that are broken. So what they would do is they would carve these often trees with no branches in. And I was looking at these ideas of beauty, but I was also thinking about all the things that, in, that I miss and all the things that I don't see. And I'd been trying to think about a way to make the things that I don't see. Do you understand what I mean? It's not pretty simple, right? But it's hard, because how do you make what you don't see? And then I realized that I've been looking at these for weeks and hadn't noticed these, and that they're made to kind of blend in, but they're so structurally important to the stability of these pieces that I thought that was kind of a beautiful metaphor for things in our lives that there's a structure to that we don't really see. As I look out here, I see you. I don't see the structure of you. Whoops. Pretend you didn't see all those. I don't know why it's doing that. Going forwards. Close your eyes. Seriously, do me a favor, close your eyes. I don't know why it's going the wrong way. Okay. It's not as fun if you see it all coming and I don't get to talk about it. Sorry, I don't, it's out of my control. Um, so then you can see how this, you see that tree in there and you see how it's, it's pretty stiff and it's, there's that decoy and that, there's the seat from the unicycle again. And I started thinking about that tree and I really started to, think, okay, I'm going to spend some time with this. You know, and I don't think that, hey, folks, I don't, I think your work, if you're interested in something, I think you should dig into it. And it's really easy to say, gosh, geez, I think I've spent, and I do this. I spend a lot of time with this, and I like making them. And they're, cha they're still challenging for me, and I feel like you can invest, if you get into something, dig in deep. So I think it's easy for us to kind of very much hit things on the surface and not really get anywhere with it. So again, here's one of these trees, and I started to use some steel again with the work. And I wanted to, and for me, these, I've always wanted to do more drawing, and I'm, I'm just, it doesn't ever work with my work. So I started to be able to, I started to kind of draw with steel and space. So it's just welded steel rod, and you can see the sexton there coming off, and then there's, it's kind of a bit hard to make out, but the thing that's over the, there's a street lamp that's over the illuminated part of the tree. So that's gold leaf on there. This piece is called Navigating the Decline. The decline is just another way to say sunset. 
It's another piece of that same work. They're pretty big. That piece is maybe seven feet tall. And now I started, can you see how the surfaces are starting to change a little bit? And if you were there at the demo this morning, this is just kind of starting to, this is underglaze and kind of starting to get that underglaze to move a little bit. My pieces were feeling a little bit stiff and I, I was under, it's hard to say that, but I feel like I was understanding the surfaces too much. This is a piece called Nomad and it's, those are rods and cones and that's the seat of a motorcycle. And I was looking into sight and how we see I was starting to think about, and I, then, okay, I want to talk about how we look at things and how we see. Well, am I going to make an eyeball? That seems a little obvious. So I, by researching sight, then I kind of got into the idea of using rods and cones to talk about the photo sensors and how we see. Again, that's powder-coated steel. That's a wall piece. It's another one of these tree forms. This piece was from China. So it's kind of a sweet experience I got to have in China that, a lot of people sit on these very small stools that are only about this high, and I couldn't do it. I couldn't sit on them. And so um, a guy I was working with made me like a taller one. <laughs> it was like the sweetest gesture. I could barely even talk to him, and he could see that I couldn't sit like everybody else could sit because I'm really inflexible. So he said, why don't you have one of these? It's like the sweetest thing. And I'd go out and just, this is like the little delicate things that happen that you don't see. You know, I'd go out and have tea with folks that I would meet because I'd be working by myself and I'd go out and have tea at this like kind of just bizarre like I don't mean strange but like a bizarre an area where they'd sell a bunch of stuff I didn't even talk to this guy we have tea almost every afternoon he didn't know what I did and one day a young woman came by as a college student and she started translating for us and he said oh I thought you worked in the field because you're always dirty <laughs> and I showed him one day I brought a which just totally makes sense and one day I brought a postcard to show him an image of my piece and he just kept pointing like you need a stamp and it was so obvious, you know what I mean, that I'm showing him this, and he's like, yeah, you need to stamp to make this work. So we would have these really interesting encounters with like no, with, with not with like, with no words. This is a piece called um, Separating the Rods and Cones. And you can see some of the different imagery coming together here. You can see the rods, there's a wishbone, and there's that, uh, there's that tree form that sticks around for quite a while. So then I wanted to see how that piece would work on its own, if I could isolate it, or if it needed to be with all these other things, or does that just make it confusing? Can this exist by itself? So this piece called Cascade. This is simple surface. This is what I was doing today. Just put that underglaze on there, pour buckets of water over it, and just let it move, and just keep doing it. And as you're looking at it, the whole thing's kind of slowly moving, and then you just stop. So I got really excited about this, and I made about 20 of them. Not gonna show, I did, I, I went, I like took the Kool-Aid or whatever and just did it. But I loved making them and I loved glazing them. And I never used to like glazing. So I'm like, I'm gonna just swim around in this pool that I like being in. And my students are like, oh yeah, you're gonna make another tree. I'm like, hey, I'm into it. So I just did it for a while and I loved it. And all right, I'm keeping going. I'll tell you what was really, engaging for me is that I still really like a lot of the just straight formal qualities of making sculpture and resolving objects in space and working this way building these things they're all different and you got to resolve them you got to kind of deal with it and get out there and figure out what they need here's a detail so you can see what that looks like that looks really blown out we're skipping that okay back to China I'm almost done I'll get it done in under an hour so went back to China. So I got invited to come out. They said, hey, we have this. So I was working with this museum. And they said, hey, we have this gallery. You want to have a solo show? And I was, now by this time in my life, I realized, just say yes. Yes, I would love to do this. Come out here and make this work. That stuff is huge. That piece on the right, or yeah, on your right, is maybe 10 feet tall. Super big. I made them all in six weeks. I went out there, so I got to go to work. I go out there, oh, I just work, 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 work like crazy. Go home. For a year and a half, going for a year, sorry, I just yelled, was that really loud? No. Went home for a year and a half and came back and I looked at these pieces and I was like, these suck. They are so bad. I went way too fast. All I cared about was how big they were because I thought I had, you know, I was gonna fill this big, huge space. Didn't use any of them. See that guy in the back there? Beautiful man, just amazing. And he's making these pots. And the folks who run this place, they said, hey, we were, if you wanna, kind of be 
get influence while you're here. Get, you know, pull something from what's going on. Well, I was real sensitive about that. So I'm real aware of the idea of cultural appropriation. What am I going to just go over here and start writing Chinese characters on this? That didn't make a ton of sense. So he was making these big pots, and I really loved him. And I thought, okay, maybe if I could work with him. And he did. And it wasn't really a true collaboration because he made something, he gave it to me, and I never gave it back. And we never communicated about it. So it was more of a, a trade, or I don't know, any, I'm not sure how to explain it. So he made the bottoms of these, and then I built off the top of them and had a heck of a good time doing it. And I learned a lot. I learned a lot about his way of building, which I tried to do and could not do at all. He'd come over and, sorry, John. John was in there working with me, and we'd both, we'd watch him work. He'd come watch us work, and he was fascinated by us working, which felt so clunky to me compared to what he was doing. He was like, what he was doing was fluid and almost just like building with water. Just, you go in there in these pieces. He could build these things so fast. So this man, Nighty, look at that. Look at that. So that, Nighty Changmo is his name, and he's from Thailand. Nighty is one of the most gentle souls you'll ever meet and builds like nobody you've ever seen. And here's what, hey, folks, I want to say something real clear, too. I'm not saying go build the biggest thing you can make. There's something for me that I really like building big work. It challenges me in my studio practice. And I'm showing you pictures of big work, but you can, you can challenge yourself on the smallest scale, too. Um, but you get to work with pretty fantastic people like Nighty. So this, the other thing I want you to see, that's sweat. See, that gross is right. That's my shirt. That's also about, I'm not kidding you, 25 minutes before I got to take off to the airport to fly home. So after that show, I had like a week, or not even, had five days. I'm talking to this guy, I'm like, hey, maybe we should do some more. Let's do some big ones, because what am I going to do for four days? So we made these things, and I had people helping me, and anyways, blah, blah, blah. Then I came back home, and I thought, well, I really like putting those pieces on pots, but it doesn't really make sense. What am I going to build this Chinese gourd pot? So I tried to do it here with this kind of, you know, strangely uh, Greek yard pot. I don't know, <laughs> you know, but I tried it. And the steel on there, it's hard to see, but they have little tips on the ends, and those are from the, the things in the grandfather clock. Keep the time. Okay, we're almost done. I never showed greenware. I guess I do. I showed greenware the whole time, but this is, I've never finished this stuff. So this is where I'm not sure if I'm, well, I'll tell you what I am. Is I was, I'm excited about what I've got going on in the studio, but I'm also a little bit nervous because I've made all these molds of these different antlers. And I live in Montana, and I'm like, oh, my God, did I just turn into a, 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 an antler artist? I'm like, hey, this could be like a really slippery slope. So I started making these. I started making these steel. I cast these. Uh, so these are slip casts, and I cast these steel tubes. It's very simple. So I live at the edge of what's called like the urban wildland uh, interface. Right behind my house is absolutely wild forever. So everything kind of dumps out into our yard. Everything dumps out into Missoula. Bears, mountain lions, deer. Every day in the newspaper, there's some kind of article about animal interaction. We also have this urban deer problem. We have these deer, they live in people's yards, they live in my yard, blah, blah, blah. There's not, it's, it's this thing that's kind of beautiful, but also kind of not at the same time. It's not really right. And there's, a, there's something about the fear that's leaving them that's a little bit alarming. So I thought, well, I think about this all the time. I'm going to make some pieces about it. So the steel is clearly kind of a reference to the human side. And then you can see the, I'm not sure why that's not moving. We'll probably jump back like 10. OK, wow, it's really blown out. There's one of them. Let me get back up. Oh, goodness gracious, hold on. Shouldn't be so hard, I'm close. I want to get to that last slide. It's worth it. Oh, yeah, you can go back. Just go back one, please. So anyways, if you want to see that antler stuff, I brought it over to the gallery, which I wasn't sure if I was going to do, you know, because Brett's running this place, and it's like the slip casting capital of the world. And here I am trying to do this stuff. But I think it's good for me to get it out and look at it and talk to people about it and see what I think. Let's just, OK. The last thing I'm trying to do that I'm working on now in the studio that I can't get to work is 
I just want you to see kind of where I'm going and what I'm thinking, and then we'll answer some questions and you all can get on with your evening. But these are pieces I've been thinking about. So I think about things for a long time, sometimes too long. I probably thought about this for two years. And I'm going to explain this really simply because I don't have an image to do it. But if you think about color and how color works, how we see color, color has a wavelength and a frequency. Each one is different. Blue is like this. Yellow is like this. So what I did is I took that frequency and I put it into the computer and I spun it 360 degrees. And then I blew it up 300,000 times. And then I took that and then now by this point I'm getting help because I can't do this part on the computer. And we were talking about this earlier about having people help you make your work. So then I got over to a friend's shop who's got a CNC router and he cut out the pattern of this for me and it's about this big. So then we slip cast it so then my goal is to put this up on the wall so that you can and glaze it blue so you can look at the blue, feel, see the frequency. I would love it if the whole wall was covered with the frequency of blue and you looked at blue and felt blue at the same time. So we'll see. I'm going to pick Brett's brain a little bit. I can't get it to work. They love cracking. I, I've made like eight of them. Oh, and it takes like five gallons of slip and the mold weighs an ungodly amount. So, but even if it fails, it's fun to think about. And I can make it out of a different material or something. You know what I mean? So, um, folks, thank you for coming, and I hope that you got something from this, and thanks for coming to the lecture today. If you want to ask some questions, I'm happy to answer them, and if, if you don't, sometimes people don't like to raise their hand and ask questions. I'll stick around for a little bit afterwards if you just want to come up and chat, but if you want to talk a little bit now and ask some questions, that'd be great. That's it. want to talk let me keep talking you're ready to go home and have some pizza i just had a giant bowl of mac and cheese which was actually hard to do this on it was like a <laughs> felt like i ate a giant turkey that's a good question mm. gosh i don't know i uh i don't know i don't know if i have one you know i think that that's a good question i think i have them at the time and I'll tell you what, the favorite thing I have right now going on is probably the new stuff, just because I don't understand it. You know, and we were talking earlier about that idea of not understanding what you're doing sometimes in the studio. And I just want to say this to the whole group, because I really believe this. Um, I think that sometimes when you're in your studio and you, you look at something and you're thinking, this is really good. You know, you have this thought in your head, you're like, this is good. And then a second later, you go, what is this? And then five minutes later, you're like, I'm a genius. And then you just, this flips back and forth. And I think that sometimes that's because we can't see what we're looking at and we don't understand it yet. There's not a spot in here for it yet because you haven't made it. When you're working on a series, you got an idea, you got a grip on it, but when you don't, so my point is, and I'm not saying that work I'm doing now is gonna go somewhere, but I'm a believer that if you start getting that flip back and forth feeling about a piece, you're excited, you're not, I think you're right next to something good. And the interesting thing about making is that we can't often see what's next. So I kind of take that as a cue that maybe you're close to something, even if that's not it. So that's a really roundabout answer to I don't know what my favorite piece is. Was I that clear? I couldn't have been that clear. It's got to be. You guys got to be sitting here going, "What in the world? Why? Why did you do that?" No, I won't torture you and make you sit here and look at me. You want to go? I'll stick around. We can ask some questions if you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you mentioned that you might make that into something else, and you can make it. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. It is. Material, I love that question. Material is real important to me. Um, I'm very committed to clay and to working in clay, and it's not just because I teach it. Um, I love the history of the material. I like what it brings. I like where the material's going right now in the art world. Um, I like that I'm a part of a community that's really small and welcoming and huge at the same time. So there's, uh, I, I can't say it. Yeah, so I love that material, but I'm also only willing to beat my head against this mold for so long. So maybe I'll make it out of fiberglass. But what I will try and do before that is I'll probably try and press mold it. And tomorrow I'm going to ask Brett how the hell to do it, you know, and what I'm doing wrong. But I could just press mold it. But I just wanted it to kind of be, I worked so hard to make those everything perfect so the scale was correct. That, so it is true when I say to you that I did this 300,000 thing, that I wanted it to come out really clean. But if I can't get that, I'll go another direction. And I also want to be bigger. Like, I would love to see it that big and blue. And when you looked at it, because even when I hang this on my wall, because I bisque them and they crack, so I can still hang it up and look at it. 
You know, when you look at something and it ripples your eyes and you feel that vibration, it does this little vibration. So I'm hoping when it's blue and it vibrates, you'll feel that. But yeah, so that's another long answer. Yeah. Yep, I do it in crates. I, everything's in crates. So I drove here, so it was like my truck, my car's just full of work wrapped in uh, packing blankets right now in the car. But I don't get to do that very often because I live so in kind of a very rural place. So I ship everything in a crate. And I would encourage you, excuse me, if you're going to ship something to ship in a crate, if it's big, if it's heavy, ship it in a crate, pack it in there real tight, spend some time on your crate. I deal with a shipping agent. So I just call her. I say, I need to send five crates to you, Tactic, and they come to my studio. If you're shipping in boxes, I would say double box it. Spend your time. This, it, things go for a rough ride. The reason I like to put them in crates and then I put it on a pallet because people will push things. They just need to get this from here to there. But if it's on a pallet and it's big, they have to pick it up with a forklift. And a forklift is smooth and easy as opposed to people dragging it or pushing it. So big stuff's safer for me than small stuff. Okay, folks, thanks for coming. Nice to see your smiling faces.